Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. Now this is the one hour chart of silver overlaid over the Euro US dollar cross provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. So you can see here that silver is rallying um, right along with the Euro. Um, looking at the MACD, it kind of looks like this may continue and turn up here. Um, it's interesting, the dollar strength story had been touted for a very long time, and I was looking for a top in the dollar, a uh, short-term top. That may be here now with the yelling, hemming and hawing about when to raise interest rates. Um, we can see in crude oil that the the oil is really spiking up. I mean, this is a pretty big spike if you look at it. Let's pull it up on the daily. So not really big uh, percentage-wise, you know, over the long term, but a pretty big move in the short term. So we're looking for maybe a revival of some inflation expectations. Not really sure, although the stock market is cratering. Um, well, it went down about 300 points today. Let's pull up the chart and take a look at it. It, it still kind of has that rolling over look, but it, it tends to, it's been very, very volatile. Um, even at these lofty levels, the moves have been quite volatile. If we pull it out to the daily, we can see here. So it's still building into one of those uh, rolling over patterns. Let's go to the weekly because that shows the rally all the way back from 2009. It's been a very, very long bull market in stocks since 2009. I don't think anybody really uh, called this one. Uh, I, I was shocked by the um, size of this rally. I didn't think that they could uh, pull this out the way they did, but they're printing money in there, putting it into... Uh, people love to say the 1%. It's not the 1%. <laughs> you know, the the 1% or people make even more than $150,000 a year in the 1%, so that's dumb. It's the 0.0001% the billionaires, uh, the Elon Musks of the world that uh, are getting rich from these uh, stock swindles. Um, but I wanted to get to the main story tonight. Now, you know we talked about Blanche P. I came after Blanche P. because he was attacking Perth and defending debt, which I thought was just absurd. A lot of comments on that, very controversial video. I pretty much agree with everything I said there. Uh, maybe I was a little bit too harsh on him, but I don't think so. At least from a stacker's perspective, he, he you know, portrayed himself as, you know, an alternative uh, investment type guy. And here he's giving straight Wall Street advice. But let's look at what's going on with the China story. The China story is a story I've talked about for a long time. Um, I've said for the longest time, you know, quoting Jimmy Rogers, that the 21st century is going to be the century of China. And uh, the, the stories have been coming, I've been covering the stories for years about China's demise. It's not happening. So here's the latest uh, brick in the wall here. U.S. hegemony dollar dominance are officially dead as China scores overwhelming victory in bank battle. It's official. Everyone has caught on to the fact that the Asian infrastructure investment bank story is extremely important. We've covered this exhaustively over the past month, but to summarize, the China-led development bank essentially marks an epical shift away from traditionally U.S.-dominated multinational institutions like the IMF and the ADB. Meanwhile, it also represents an implicit attempt by the Chinese to usher in a kind of Sino-Monroe doctrine and solidify their regional and, to a certain extent, their international ambitions. In a desperate attempt to undermine the effort and preserve what's left of U.S. hegemony, Washington aggressively lobbied its allies last year to refrain from supporting the effort. Then the UK decided to join, calling the bank an unrivaled opportunity. That effectively opened the floodgates and, in short order, a bevy of Western nations and close US allies suddenly reversed course and indicated they were likely to support the new institution. Here's more. And 
you can see here, Canada, Australia, and then we had Britain, and uh, Japan's going to be next. So big, big story. Um, this was inevitable. We knew this was coming. I'm going to show you when we look at the coins. Uh, I'm going to remind you of what I told you about, that we knew this was coming. Um, but let's look at this article here. This is from the Asian, this is from .cn, uh, I think this is translated from the Chinese press. Um, but uh, this is a, a headline here. Yeah, EnglishNews.cn. China's focus, China likely to maintain 7% growth for 20 years. And, you know, I've, I've covered the China bashers so much. Uh, there was a story on Yahoo about the slowdown in China, a slowdown to 7.4% growth. Uh, and anybody knows the laws of large numbers, I've talked about it before. Um, if you go from seven, you know, if you have this huge trillion dollar economy and you go from 7.4% growth to 7.3, um, it's the same growth. So uh, you can't keep growing at 10%. But let's look at how, how fast China's been growing. Um, this really gives the numbers you're not gonna get in the Western press. China has lowered its 2015 economic growth target to about 7% a growth pace which analysts said could be maintained for 20 years as the country continues to enjoy huge development potential. Addressing the opening of the annual session of the National People's Congress, China's top legislator, legislature, Premier Li Qingquang said the target down from last year, 7.5% is in line with efforts to create a moderately prosperous society. Actually, economic growth last year was 7.4%, the lowest since 1990. Quote, if China's economy can grow at this rate for a relatively long time, we, we will secure a more solid material foundation for modernization, Li said. Lu Feng, a professor with Peking University's National School of Development, said the 7% target, though the lowest in more than a decade, still represents a medium-high level of growth, and the Chinese economy has the potential to maintain the speed over the next 20 years. Now look at these facts here. I, I'm not going to bring out the calculator on this one, but uh, I did bring out the calculator and calculate these. And if you start with the 1978 figure, and I just chose a billion as an example, um, you come to a hundredfold gain. And then if you project out the next 20 years, you come to a 150-fold gain. So imagine an hourly wage uh, being 150 times, 100 to 150 times what it was in 1978. That's the type of growth we're talking about that has occurred and what is still occurring in China. Between 1978 and 2013, annual growth of the Chinese economy averaged close to 10%. That's 10% growth for 40 years. That's amazing. However, the good old days had to end with growth decelerating to 7.7% in 2012 and 2013. To diffuse problems and avoid falling into the middle income trap while achieving modernization, China must rely on development, which requires an appropriate growth rate, the Premier said in his government work report delivered to top legislator. Legislature. With the Chinese economy entering a new normal, policymakers have been trying to balance the need to cushion the economy's slowdown with monetary and fiscal support measures against long-term goals. In order to realize the country's development goals set for 2020, ensure employment and avoid financial and fiscal risks, it's imperative for China to maintain a medium high level of growth and achieve a medium level of development. Justin Yifi Lin uh, former chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank said, the country has promised to double GDP achieving achieved in 2010 by 2020 to achieve this a year-on-year -year expansion rate of 6.8% from 2014 to 2020 would be sufficient. So another double in 10 years. So that's what we're looking at. Um, that's what's happened. The China bashers have been wrong and we knew they were going to be wrong because China has been doing everything right. The West has been doing everything wrong um, and that's that's what happens. So I want to remind you here of what I told you before uh, that this was inevitable and not only is it was it inevitable that this is going to happen but the Western powers knew that this was going to happen. So 
if we go back to the zero hedge story, you can see here the countries that we have listed here that bailed on the U.S. Britain, Canada, Australia, and we know Europe and Japan are going to leave as well. And that we're talking about the U.S. isolated. That's what we're talking about. But look at the coins. These are the coins I covered before. Here's the Silver Britannia. You can't see this one because uh, it's on the actual edge of the coin. But this is the Horse Privy. That actually started, uh, they had a snake privy, so it's been going on for a while. Here's an acknowledgement by the British of the Chinese lunar calendar. The They're making coins with a recognition of China. Here's the Perth Mint. Now the Perth Mint was the first on board with the Lunar Series 1 and 2. They've been doing it for a long time. Uh, they're physically closer to China than any of the others. Here you go. Here's the horse privy on that kookaburra. Here's a horse privy on the Canadian maple leaf horse privy. Tipping the hat to China. And here's, uh, well, I missed the, there it is. There is the African wildlife series. That's from the Austrian mint. And there's your horse privy right there. And they're doing goat privies this year. So here we have these Western powers recognizing uh, the importance of China's emergence on the world stage, and they're recognizing it by putting it into their silver coins. I've said for the longest time, silver is the most undervalued asset in the history of the world. It's the most important investment. It's the Achilles heel of the banksters. There's no question about it that it's their Achilles heel. Um, it is not a coincidence that the smackdown in silver and the five simultaneous margin increases that occurred in May of 2011 were preceded by a weekend where we had the release of Barack Obama's birth certificate and the capture and killing of Osama bin Laden. That was the same weekend. Then we had the Boston bombing on tax day in the United States, and that was when we had the major collapse below that $26 price in silver. So silver, the, the former Western powers, China, this lunar coin, these are all connected together. It's very, very important. And as I mentioned, Jimmy Rogers before, Jimmy Rogers said that the 21st century is going to be the century of China, just as the 20th century was the century of America, and there was the century of Britain, there was the century of Spain, Portugal, etc. This is going to be the century of China. They're not going to slow down, no matter what the China bashers say. They're going to continue to grow, and as Jimmy Rogers said, uh, you're not really probably going to be able to invest directly in China. But what you can do is you can find something that the Chinese want to buy. And if you sell something to the Chinese because they're going to be rich, you sell them something they want to buy, uh, you're going to be rich. And the thing the Chinese are going to want to buy are these silver coins, the Lunar Series 1 and 2, and these Lunar Series Privy coins. Uh, these are the best coins out there. Um, the Belange P bashing of the um, the first coin in the Lunar Series 2, uh, the, a one that has appreciated 5 to 10 fold, um, that's a dead giveaway. So these coins are a no-brainer. They're a layup. Uh, we're going to continue to go forward covering these coins. These are my favorite coins, and I will continue to cover them for the members. Um, when I buy a coin, I always post on the member site, um, I'm buying now, I pulled the trigger, this is what I bought, I'll let people know when there's any left over. Uh, as I pointed out in the comments, uh, the members snapped up that horse series, the, the horses are gone, and by the way, the, the Lunar series now is getting very, very thin, um, and it just, I, I'm not really sure. Are, Chi are the Chinese buying up all these coins? Is the Perth Mint being tight-fisted with them? Um, I think the time is coming fairly soon where you're just really not going to be able to get any new issues out of the Perth Mint. 
Uh, I don't know how far off that date is, but I think that date's going to be fairly soon. Certainly the Perth Mint, I think, doesn't really want to get rid of a very important natural resource. Uh, their physical silver at these ridiculously low prices. We're talking about prices here at $17. We're talking about prices that are lower than where they were at the Bear Stearns top. This is when the real estate market collapsed um, and we went into the financial crisis. And you can see that that's just a blip on the radar screen compared to what has happened since then the up and the down. Uh, so China is still surging forward. I believe the demand for Lunar Series coins, uh, especially Perth Mint Lunar Series 2, but even the privies, it's very clear from the actions of the British Mint, the Australian Mint, the Canadian Mint, and now the Bavarian Mint or Europe. We're talking Europe. Britain, Canada, Australia, we're seeing America being left out here, uh, probably going to have to be the last one to bow to China, the new emerging power of the century. And we'll talk to you next time.